Good evening, everyone. Let's um, let's let's open in a, a word of prayer. God, we we come before you this this Lord's day. We we approach your throne where your son sits, crowned with all authority after he conquered death and was was granted kingship over over his kingdom here on earth. God, we we approach you in prayer, acknowledging its power. We acknowledge the world around us and the battles that we face. God, we I want to lift up just the world before you and the violence that is occurring all all over the all over the place, Lord. It's hard to it's hard to take a look at the countries and not be not be concerned and just heartbroken by by what we have we have decided to do with the the stewardship that you've given us father we we beg your mercy as we as we seek to proclaim your your kingdom to the nations god help us to always set our eyes on you and to seek your your kingdom with all your purposes god i pray for clarity and i pray that your word would would give us Give us new life and new breath. Father, I pray that your spirit would come to this place and that it would, it would just give us a, a, a refreshing moment as we, we are able to gather and, and, and worship you, God. You are, you are so great. And we, we worship and praise you. And in your son's name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, I know I've been going through the book of First Samuel, but since it's kind of... It seems like a unique Sunday. I decided to kind of share what's been some things that have been on my heart over the last over the last four four or five months, and hopefully, hopefully, just uh, be a time of encouragement. And as we as we seek to ask ourselves the question of, of we are in the kingdom now, so what? Well, what, what do we? What is it? What do we do with this? What are we? What are we aiming for? Where are our sights set? Um, why do we wake up? Why do we? Why do we breathe? Why do we do what we do? Have, has anyone ever been asked a question uh, over the course of your life? What do you want to do when you grow up? Has anyone ever been asked that? A show of hands. Maybe a few. I'm hoping a lot because I'll never forget when I was when I was like three or four years old. That would, that would be like the first question that anyone would ask you as a young person. Oh, what do you want to do when you grow up? And as a young person, you're, you're kind of put in this corner like, I have to choose. <laughs> I have to choose. There are so many options. So in my, uh, kind of my inability to comprehend the world, I decided that I wanted to be a tornado killer. Um, <laughs> I can explain how I came to these conclusions. Uh, it was a mixture of not understanding worldly entertainment, but I was convinced that I could go out and kill a tornado when it came and save all these people. So I think for about three years of my life, I walked around saying, I'm going to be a tornado killer. Um, yeah, it, it's kind of laughable. In my mind, I was four and my, my life was going to be, I'm going to be a tornado killer and I'm going to measure my success by the number of tornadoes that I kill. And that's what I'm going to live for. Yeah, it, it, I, I think back to that and I laugh at it because even though it was planted in me at a very early age, this notion that you have to pick what you want to be when you grow up and that's going to define you, it's, it's pervasive. And it hijacks, it really hijacks a sense of purpose of why, why we live for what we live hijack as, as in the sense of I, th I think there's so much more that we are called to in its simplicity but somehow we've chosen to elevate what the world asks us above God's purpose and what he has us here for on this earth so I want to I want to pose a question to to every to all of you who who profess to be Christians Christian what what is your profession what, what do you do? Um, I've, I've spent a lot of time thinking about this. I don't, sometimes I think that we, we actually choose. We say, I'm going to wear my, my hat that I'm going to be, an, I don't know what, any career, name it. I'm going to be a doctor and I'm going to be a Christian on the side. 
I'm gonna be a driver. Put my, and then I'll put my Christian hat on when I have to. But uh, I took a little bit, I, I would encourage you to do this, I took a little bit of time and I just read the first sentence or the first paragraph in every, every book in the New Testament. And it's striking to me the amount of times that right off the bat, Paul, Peter, Jude, James, they immediately associate themselves by introducing themselves as Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ. So right, right in the first sentence, we see, someone, we see the apostles introducing themselves. They immediately tie themselves to, to Christ, and they immediately pronounce their profession as a bondservant. As if they're, and they, they, had a, they had a lot of other things they could boast about, but when we look at ourselves, how often do we, do we encounter someone and do we say, hi, my name is Zach and I, um, I was born here. And maybe towards the end, of a, the end of a conversation, someone might find out about the faith that you profess. It's a, sho it's a, shocking, it's a shocking notion, but it's, I'll, I'll read you the books in the New Testament where the authors immediately identify themselves. Acts, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus, Philemon, James, 1 and 2 Peter, and Jude. So, as I said, there seems to be this, this shocking difference today that we, we've actually moved our profession as a Christian to the last thing that we mention rather than the first. Um, I send I send a lot of emails in what I do right now, and I always I always get to the end of the email and I don't know what to write. I want to I want to put something clever in that will announce my my uh, my Christianness, let's say my my faith. And I, I I spend a lot of time thinking: Should I say blessings? Should I say His servant? But back in the day, they would have started it. They would have said. I am Zach and I, I serve Christ and this is my message and there's no doubt as to my intention. Researchers, um, researchers across a wide body of knowledge has act, have actually discovered that when somebody acknowledges or commits to a notion before an action, they're about 60% more likely to be honest in that proclamation. So I'll give you an example. When, has anyone ever filled out taxes to, no taxes, okay. Okay. Uh, so I filled out taxes and you, you fill out these lines of like how much money you made and you go, this is how much money I made, this is how many children I have. And at the end of the document, there's a statement that says, where you sign your name and you say, I swear, I, I, uh, everything above this line is true and what they found is people are about 60 percent more likely to lie about the taxes they made to pay less when the line is on the bottom when you sign afterwards versus when you sign on top all, all they did was move the signature line to the top of the document you sign that you're going to tell the truth and then people become more honest in what they fill out so i think that this notion of of really acknowledging that our profession of Christians, that we are first and foremost bondservants of Christ, everything else that we do is secondary, I think it would, it would draw a powerful conclusion in the way that we walk about and interact with people. Um, yeah, another, another example of this is in, is in courtrooms. Has anyone ever heard of like an, uh, where, you, where you swear, and we as Christians don't swear, but we affirm that we're gonna tell the truth? The reason people do this is that we, we're, we're geared as humans to commit to something before we get into it. So I, I would push us, at, push us to, to try to realign ourselves to say, do you know what? As a Christian, my profession is to be a servant, that, just as the apostles were. So if everyone would open their Bibles with me to the book of First Thessalonians. First Thessalonians, and 
the, set, the setting of this book is, especially the first few chapters, Paul is, Paul is writing the church in, the church in Thessalonica, and he, he's acknowledging that before them, that he ministered to them and that they became imitators to him. And I was thinking about this notion of why, why is it that we, we want to tell someone, somebody that we do something? Why, why do we care about what man thinks of us? And in verse 4 of chapter 2 of 1 Thessalonians, Paul is able to make the claim along with um, Sylvanus and Timothy that we speak to you not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed, nor did we seek glory from people. And I'm, I'm convinced that the reason that when somebody asks us, what do you do? Our first inclination is to say, to search for something beyond our Christianity because I think sometimes we, we want to please the person that we're talking to or that we we really seek glory from from humanity and, but and I'm kind of struck by this notion that I sometimes I haven't been able to to my shame I haven't been able to say with confidence I don't know I'm not trying to please man I'm not trying to seek glory so in conclusion I contend that the first thing that comes to your mind when someone asks you or somebody asks your children, what do you do? The first thing you should say, I'm a bondservant of Christ and be confident in what you say and maybe that will define the conversation that follows you. Um, I'll tell, when I first came to Followers of the Way, I, I was reminded by this because when I was walking here, the Oteri's van has, writ has a bold text written on it and it's Shane correct me if I'm wrong it's found in Acts chapter 2 on the side of your van Philippians. or Philippians 2 yeah. or yeah I just walked I think it, it might be Acts anyway regardless I walked by that van and I was like wow that's a bit much <laughs> like these people like there's a, someone proclaiming their Christianity as the first thing that someone will think about them and I'm like oh they're gonna scare people away but now that I've kind of thought about it, and I rethought about it when I walked by the van today, how great it is that we have confidence to assert our profession as being bond servants of Christ. So now, so now we move into this question of, all right, as Christians, our profession is being bond servants of Christ. So what does that, what does that mean? What are we, what are we laboring for as Christians? What, what, what is your profession? What are you trying to accomplish? And I want, to, I want you to take a moment to reflect on, on the following question. What is your hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming? So at, at the end of this life, when you stand before Jesus as king, what... What are you gonna be? What are you gonna say, Lord? I, you gave me this life, and this is what I this is what I boast about. When I was a uh, when I was four years old, I think I I would have said, Oh, I'm gonna be a tornado killer, and I want to kill the most tornadoes. But the entry into the kingdom of God changes literally everything every single notion of what we what our joy and our our crown of boasting is going to be at the end of this life um a few months ago i i'd actually i never thought about this question intently when i not not seriously but because of life circumstances um, brother finney had traveled to minnesota to be to be with my family and I on my next to my mom on her deathbed and I was searching for for comfort in God's word I was searching for a way to to look at to look at someone at the end of their life and to say and to search for the words for what you're gonna share and brother brother Finney he he came and he opened to first Thessalonians chapter 2 verses 19 to 20 so if you kind of skip over to those 
chapter 2, verse 19 and 20. And Brother Finney, being the man he has, has his own translation, so I'll read. I actually have it taped in my Bible. But For what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting? So if you bring it back to that question I asked. And Paul, he declares confidently, Is it not indeed you before our Lord Jesus at his coming? For you are our joy, are our glory and joy. That's a, it's a shocking answer to be able to comfort someone at the end of their life and say, it's not about what you did or the, the righteousness that you attained, but it's about those that you poured into. So as Christians, the answer to what are we going to be able to boast about when we come to Jesus at the end of our life, if we intrinsically, our answer is to, to look at ourselves and say, I did this, I did that, I was righteous, I was holy. I, I really think we miss a big point of what we strive for to imitate the great king. And out of this, out of this, uh, these two verses, I want to make a, couple, a few points here. So one, I, I no notice that I, when I posed to you the question, I said, what is your joy? Or uh, what is your hope or joy or crown of glory? But Paul, when he, when he asks it, he, he switches that and he says, what is our hope? And just a, a simple point is, we have a collective hope as Christians. We're not alone as individuals. We, we are co-laborers in our profession. We are equals. Um, I got, I got a, has anyone ever been to the Behalt in, in Ohio? So in Ohio, there's this, there's this really famous painting where a man came and he tried to paint the story of, of the Mennonites and the, the Anabaptists in this big octagon and it completes this circle. And the notion that we can plug our stories and tie our ways directly back to Christ as a collective group of people and put ourselves on the timeline, it's immense. If you can, if you can look back and you can point to the martyrs of our faith and say, I live that way. This is, I am part of this people. These are, this is my spiritual ancestry. It's an incredibly powerful notion to be able to teach even your children and to say, you know what, if you look at our collective hope, we are in this spectrum of the, of the, the whole story. I was, I was particularly moved. I know that the stories of martyrs, um, they elicit a lot of emotion and a kind of a lot of, well, why, why do I even wake up when there are these people that have walked before me and given literally everything? But there are these two martyrs named Joseph and Michael Hoffer. They were, they were Hutterites in South Dakota during, during World War I. Has anyone, has anyone ever heard of their story? So in, in World War I, um, there's a there's a dra there's the U.S. government was sort of drawing in soldiers into the army, and these these two soldiers or these two young boys they were from a Hutterite colony they were conscientious objectors and they refused the service and the, U the U.S. government in turn locked them up and sent them to Alcatraz and then held them there for their their sentence was 20 years and then they were shipped to to Leavenworth where they were strung up by chains and held in a, held in a, held in a prison camp and, and they, uh, they ended up dying there. And as a, and as a last show of, of sort of a slap in the face to their community, the gov whoever was in charge, I'm not sure, they, they, put the, they, they put the bodies and they dressed them in the, US, the uniform which they had refused. They put them in coffins, wrapped them in the American flag and sent them back to their families. And I look at these stories of these people that have walked before us, and I see the hope of these young boys, and I see the hope of every martyr that has walked before us, and I reaffirm the passion for the collective hope that we have that should constantly reignite us as a people. And I look at them, and I know that similar sentiments has been shared, but 
We should be pushed by our collective hope not to loiter for the kingdom. We, there's a great cloud of witnesses before us, and these are the people that we attempt to imitate. Yeah, our hope. The second, second simple point I want to make in this is, is pretty straightforward. It's just our hope or joy or crown boasting and is, is in the people around us. We are servants of Christ and we seek to imitate him that others might imitate us. It's not going to be about the number of hours I spent um, sending emails, the number of hours I spent building or building a house or doing whatever career that I choose to do. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be about relationships and it's going to be about people. We, we know that right from the beginning. May we, I hope that we can never get distracted by our, by our careers. It's so easy to get wrapped up in, in what we're studying, what we're aiming to, to become as a, as a world pleaser. And I hope that one day we can stand before the Lord and we can we we're not we, we don't point to ourselves but we point to the people who we we were we were teaching to imitate us that we might magnify Jesus in the people we pour into I think it's a it's a super powerful notion to to kind of reframe your mind into what am I what am I going to boast about before Jesus himself another Another really interesting thing that I've been reflecting on, and I, I'm going to speak specifically to the young, the young in the crowd with this point. When Finney, when Finney said that to my mom, he was, trying, he was trying to elicit this notion that when par as parents pour into their children, that at the end of their lives, you will be a huge part of who your parents will point to in this lifetime. And this notion that it, it, it kind of it kind of hits me every time that when I think about the life of my parents that brought me up that I I seek to be somebody that my mom can point to if she ever if if she stands before Jesus and says this is my joy or crown of boasting and how much more does that drive us to appreciate appreciate your parents and everything they pour into you I'm constantly reminded that. As a family, this is what we, this is what ties us together, and that we create this huge cycle of life that we can be proud of, and that you can be proud of your parents, and or pride, proud is an interesting word that we can, that we can look at each other and be like, well done, this is what we came to do, this is why we are here. And I look, I look at the members of the body of, out out among you, and I. For the first time in my entire life, I, I think I find myself as part of something that I want others to look at me and I want them to imitate what I am doing. And I look at each of you and I, I see the example that you've been and I thank each of you because in this notion of this First Thessalonians, you've taught me to imitate the way and I look at you and I, I'm driven to be imitators of Christ because of your example before us. And I'm not trying to... I'm not trying to just like offer you offer empty words, but words of encouragement, and that you are you are making a difference in the world. And I'm passionate about this notion of multiplication. That each of you, of you have sought truth in your own lives, has spread it into mine. Whatever age you might be, even even the children have been huge influences in my life. And just coming and sitting next to me when I first came into the church. So, so thank you. Thank you for that. We have, a, we have a, an earthly family right here in front of us when, when the bonds of family seem to fade away. The last point, not the last point, another point I want to make is this endeavor before us, this endeavor to be servants of Christ and to labor to be, to to find people to imitate us, it certainly is not going to be easy. I'll, I'll repeat that. It is not going to be easy. We're not promised. We're not promised rainbows and butterflies. Unfortunately, if you if you just read through First Thessalonians, I'll, I'll read you some of the words that come before Paul Paul's promise of boasting: much affliction, suffering, shameful treatment conflict, 
labor and toil, working night and day, an endeavor. So as we, as we seek to, to be servants of Christ as our profession, I pray that we will never be deceived to think that we, we were promised a cakewalk because those before us, it wasn't a cakewalk for them. And when we, we confront these toils and these endeavors that are set before us, let, let us refocus on what we, what we live for. We live to be servants and we, we live to be image bearers of Christ so that other, others, we can spread this to other people. And this is, this is the great hope. We're part of, I, would, I would contend we are part of the greatest story that mankind has ever known. Have you ever thought about that? We, we are part of the greatest story mankind has ever known or will be ever, ever be able to tell. And if we, sometimes it's easy to get tired. It's easy to, to not know why we're here, what we're, what we're seeking. And I pray that you would to just do a simple check. This is what I wake up for. This is why I'm here. This is why I came to Boston. I know each of us have had a long story leading up to that. And we imitate a king who, who did not come to, to be served, but to serve and to wash his disciples' feet. It's, it's as simple as that. We, our notion, we should, servants, we should be pouring out. We should be elevating or putting ourselves below those we serve. And we don't, the last simple point is, we don't, we don't labor in vain because we await the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He, he's coming in, in the behold. They, so in this painting, they, they paint a picture of Jesus and then Jesus is actually bigger. And then when you walk around, it ends with Jesus' kingdom coming. And the, the promise that is promised to us in the book of Matthew where... It says, when the gospel of the kingdom has pro been proclaimed to all nations, then I will come. We, this is the promise that we believe in, and this is the promise that we live by. When the enemy tries to, to sow these seeds of doubt in your mind, um, how many of you have ever woken up and been like, is this really, is this really what, what this life is about? Am I the only one? Maybe I'm the only one. Where I, at the end of the day, after I'm tired and I, maybe things didn't go the right way, maybe I lost the key, maybe I don't know what happened. Things are tough. This life gets really, it batters you. Um, maybe you have a cold or you got splashed, you didn't bring an umbrella to work and it rained and you're soaking wet and you're just tired and you're like, did I really give, is this really it? I pray that you would remind yourselves that we have such a greater calling than, than the toils of everyday life. We are servants of the greatest king to have ever walked the face of this planet. And as you ponder your profession, I pray that each of us would be able to say with confidence when someone asks you, Oh Christian, what do you, what do, you do? And you say, I am a bondservant of Christ. There's nothing greater, nothing in the entire world that we could profess. All right, let, let me close us, close us in prayer. God, we, we are easily, uh, easily distracted people. God, the, the history of, of the Israelites, the history of your church shows that we we can have a tendency to, to chase after, after shiny objects. We, we forget so easily where we were four months ago or where we were five years ago. God, we are, we are new creatures and we have laid our lives at your feet. God, I pray that if any, if any of us has a seed of doubt in, in their mind about what, what am I doing here? What is it that my career is? The, the world says that I'm not doing it right. God, I pray that you would reveal those seeds of doubt and make them be, be tied directly to the enemy because they are not of you. And I pray that we would just have a renewing of our purpose, a renewing of our mind, 
I pray that we would be united in this, this profession of, of being a Christian, united in, in seeking to, to pour into those around us. God, I pray for, I pray for the, young, the young people in here as well as they are as they face the similar questions that all of us have faced and they, they seek to, to decide what they are going to do with the time that is given to them. God, may you be at the forefront of their decisions. May your kingdom, may your kingdom be at the forefront of all their ambitions and their endeavors. As they grow, I pray that they would walk in your ways. God, I, I, pray, for, I pray for the harvest. I pray, for, I pray for laborers as well, that we would be willing and able and diligent. God, we, we pray for the, the people that are perishing. We know they are precious in your sight, Lord. And we know that they are plentiful. We walk by so many each and every moment. God, may, may we be willing to identify everyone in our lives who, who we, could, we could point to you and magnify you. Oh, Father, we, we love you with, with all that we are. And in your son's name, we pray these things. Amen.